This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listeners. Thanks to every single one of you, like Jim Hart, Logan Larson, Mike Akins, and our brand new boss, Organic Computer. Coming up on DTNS, do you want to chat with non-player characters? How about learn a language from a chatbot? How about learn a language from a non-player character? This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, May 31st, 2023 in Greenville, Illinois. I'm Tom Merritt. From lovely Cleveland of the Ohio, I'm Rich Raffalino. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Shea. Ah, we almost had a no Californian show today with me out here in Illinois, but Roger Roger stepped up to represent. Yeah, holding down the fort, as they say. Good, good job, yeah. Roger. The Fort Funston. <laughs> up in Northern California. All right, let's start with the quick hits. Apple posted a reminder for its upcoming developers conference saying a new era begins. A lot of people made a big deal about the, how they don't usually say new era. Uh, join us for WWDC 23 on June 5th at 10 a.m. PT. That's Pacific time. Apple also published a blog post titled Code New Worlds. A lot of people think that relates to augmented reality. Uh, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman expects the keynote address to be longer than two hours and include several new Macs and information on a mixed reality headset and that I will be in tears if it goes past three hours. <laughs> well, if you ever wanted true wireless earbuds with customizable RGB lighting, Razer has filled that hole in Ooh. your heart. The company launched the $200 Hammerhead Pro Hyperspeed True Wireless Earbuds. And true to Razer's focus on gamers, these can connect either over your standard old Bluetooth connection or use a USB-C dongle for a lower latency 2.4 gigahertz connection. The buds also support active noise cancellation and come with a wireless charging case. Ooh, lots of products today. Garmin announced a new fitness-focused set of wearables, the Epix 2 Pro and Phoenix, spelled F-E-N-I-X, 7 Pro. Both are smartwatches, and both feature an LED flashlight, an updated heart rate sensor, weather map overlays, as well as new endurance score and hill score aggregated metrics. The Epix 2 Pro offers a traditional OLED display in three size options, rated 31-day battery life, while the Phoenix uses a memory and pixel display that supports solar charging and gives you 38 days of battery. The Phoenix Pro starts at 800 bucks. the Epix Pro at 900 bucks. Logitech is keeping the product train rolling. They refreshed their popular MX Anywhere 3S mouse. This now features an 8K DPI optical sensor to better work across surfaces. I guess if you want to, you know, mouse it on your jeans or something like that, as well as quieter mouse buttons similar to the MX Master 3 mouse. The mouse will only work with Bluetooth. There's no dongle included in the box, and Logitech said they couldn't fit the components uh, for the receiver into a small USB-C unit. The company also updated the MX Keys S keyboard that now offers teleconferencing uh, shortcuts in the function row and include some backlight customizations. Logitech also released its Smart Actions feature for its Logi Options Plus app, and this lets users automate tasks across programs with a single command, basically sophisticated macros. Yeah, I always think I want a travel mouse until I travel with one and then don't want to bother <laughs> with it. So I was attracted to this until I remembered that about myself. Uh, Google ended support for the first gen Chromecast. The OG, the dongle, the thick one, not the not the one that looked like a puck. Had a good run. It was originally launched in 2013 for 35 bucks. This means no security or system updates. So use at your own risk. But the device will remain functional as long as it remains functional. Although Google did warn users, you may notice a degradation in performance over time. Uh, it wasn't like Google rolled out a ton of support for it in recent years anyway. It last received an update in November 2022. It's first at that time in three years. Twitter has a program called Community Notes. If you didn't realize, it launched back in 2021, uh, before the current regime. Uh, the way it works is volunteer contributors can add context to posts. You may have seen this, like Community Notes say, like, uh, this may be in question, or uh, check, uh, check this link for more information, stuff like that. They're trying to combat misinformation. If the notes are voted as helpful, they will show up for all Twitter users. 
It's not just somebody in the community post a note and everybody sees it. There is a system. Uh, and recently, they improved that system after an image of an explosion at the U.S. Pentagon building went viral. Community Notes is getting the ability to add information specifically related to an image. In addition, that info will show up next to any matching images on other posts as well. Twitter intends to expand the feature to videos and posts with multiple images at some point. The reason they're expanding this is because they, they put a regular note on the text of the first image, but then people started posting the image without the original text. So it was hard to, to keep up with it. This way, once they identify an image, they'll be able to track it down or, and, and put those community notes on more of those kind of posts, which is a good expansion. Scott, did you did or did you know Community Notes was functioning like this? Do you, do you um, keep up with that? Yeah, I do. It's actually my favorite feature of Twitter, uh, especially currently. There's just so much on there that can be misconstrued or especially stuff that's big and goes viral for whatever reason. And that Pentagon photo is no, no exception to that rule. Uh, community Notes just feels like this one really smart thing on Twitter that will just make sure everybody can post whatever they want, you know, have your fun and do your thing. But we've got this one little like lifeline to, to accuracy. And I really, really, really like it. And so to hear that they're still working on it, adding things to it, making it more functional, especially in light of the future, we're all facing of AI images that, you know, look so real that we have no way of really knowing the difference or whatever, whatever it may be. I am very thankful for it. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm mostly thankful that it runs the whole span it's can be the owner of twitter elon musk getting something wrong and he gets yep. twitter noted which He's has had happened an, plenty of times has happened yep and i've seen it on the far other end of a of a small user it just happens upon uh you know a concept that he thought was real and turns out he wasn't and and uh i think it's really great i don't know how it works though because i've never had anything go that viral and had a community notes attached to it but i'm curious if somebody ever saw that and went oh shoot i was so wrong i'm gonna delete that tweet now um, I don't know how that works. Like, does yeah. the let's, thing let's, stay up? Let's poke holes in this a little because uh, it it may not need it to come down. It, it, what what has happened is they've noticed if there's a note there, it gets shared less, so it kind of mm. slows down the spread. Uh, if you're worried about like, well, people will misuse this, they'll try to game the system. They did a lot of things to help try to stop the system from being gamed. You have to get highly rated as a community member before your posts are seen by all of Twitter. And also, they do a thing where they only show the posts, I think, for the images to identify notes that are helpful to a wide range of people. Notes require agreement between contributors who have sometimes disagreed in their past ratings. And I'm wrong. It's not just about images. That's for everything. So they try not to say... To, they try to discourage groupthink by doing that, to say you're more likely to have this note succeed if you and someone you've disagreed with in the past on whether it's a problem or not agree in this case, which I oh, think is an I interesting see. way of doing it. Yeah, I agree. It reminds me of, um, weirdly, Wikipedia. I don't know if it's a very comparable mm -hmm. situation, mm -hmm. but it's this like, hey, a bunch of people contribute and this guy corrected some and this person recorrected because that was wrong and now they've agreed. Nope, that's you're correct. We've made the turn and we pivoted or whatever. It's got that similar vibe to me, and that's been something I've always, you know, as much as Wikipedia takes heat for not being perfect, I've always appreciated that that method, and it seems like it's working here. Wikipedia by way of Reddit a little bit with uh, some of the, the mm, like, sure. kind of gaming yeah, and voting yeah, and stuff yeah. like that, but I totally get your point. The one thing I have a question, though, specifically with the images stuff, because this was rolled out because images like the the pentagon photo that was going around like swag pope or something like that like have a way of like grabbing you and being like this i, I don't know at least right now like generative images like that still feel novel right whether we know them or not images have a weight to us more than just text my question is this seems designed to scale for like a photoshop age where it took time to create that image whereas someone else could create five million other pentagon attack photos or something like that and share that and this feels like that goes very slowly. I know this is only for the photos that are going viral, but if someone has seen that Pentagon picture and either realizes it a fake or not, and then generates a whole bunch of others, it's only like I, I feel like the system moves is is always going to be moving slower than the stuff that goes viral because there is there is almost infinite scale to the ability to generate images. It's not going to be perfect. No, yeah. no, it's a good point. It's not going to be perfect. It's not meant to stop variations. In fact, mm. they even said they're going to err on the side of caution in automatically applying notes uh, because they want to be more precise, but it's better than what they have now. Yeah. And the idea is to stop the easy copies, 
not the variations. Like once they've noticed, like this is this photo is wrong. What happened with the Pentagon one is they put the note on the original one, but everybody copied that image and posted yeah. it. And bots copied it and posted it. So it's really only going to be good at stopping that. There are other problems, as as you rightly pointed out. All right, well, the language learning app Memrise has been partnering with OpenAI to use GPT-3 technology in its language learning. Back in December, it added Membot to its app and website. And now it's launching a Discord integration uh, for everybody. The idea is to force you to converse in real world scenarios like you would if you lived in a country that speaks the language you're learning. You can find Memrise's app in the Discord app directory and add it to any server. You just Go ahead and do it. Once you do that, you can summon it with the command slash learn solo or slash learn together. The difference is everyone can see what you do if you choose the together option, which can be, you know, maybe you don't want to do that right away if you're still learning a language. But, uh, you know, Scott, I'm curious, uh, are you going to be uh, using this to, uh, to you know, bone up on some uh, foreign languages? Well, I really should. My brother, I have a brother and his whole family, they're all fluent Korean speakers. He's from there. And I feel like I've never... Since he came here at nine years old and he's in his 50s now, I've never really gotten around to doing that. So maybe this would push me to do that a little bit. I really like this stuff. And I think it's even more interesting that we keep seeing Discord be the place for these these bots and add-ons happen. Um, Mid-journey functions that way. Um, uh, some other things like that. And, and to me, it just seems like such an interesting happenstance that Discord is like the happy place for trying out some of this AI stuff and creating it with slash prompts and and having that kind of community aspect built in. I, I don't think anybody really, you know, thought that was going to happen. But, you know, language is interesting and our ability to, um, I guess, learn a second language or a third language uh, to me has always been hindered by the methods that were out there for me to use currently, whether it was learn it on tape or here's a book that'll help you do it or take a class. Those all seem arduous and weird. For some reason, this seems better. And I don't know why. I think it's just because it's cool and it's on the edge of tech. And maybe that's why. But I, I, I'm, I'm more interested now than ever. Uh, Hajiman, <laughs> this is for somebody who already knows a little bit, I think. But it's also meant to help you feel like you're in the country that you're in. So I tried it with Korean, which I'm trying to learn. Uh, and I quickly re realized I don't have Hangul set up on this <laughs> laptop. Uh, so I switched to my phone where I do. Then I quickly realized I am really slow at typing in Hangul. Uh, so having a different alphabet, that would be true for Russian, Japanese, Thai, so many languages, uh, I think is is adds a little difficulty level. So I went and I tried it with Spanish. And with the Spanish, it worked great. I did a hotel check-in scenario. Uh, and it was lovely to just feel like, okay, I'm just going to say what I know. And that worked. I was like, hello, my name is Tom. I'm checking in. Uh, where's the room? And everything would, uh, everything was was very smooth. And it really was a confidence builder. I like that. Yeah. And as someone who has attempted to start to learn, you know, I, I've done the Duolingo uh, for like a week or two or something like that and kind of fallen off that one of the one of the problems with that or, or in high school language classes is that like, if you don't have someone to converse with, like it's, you, it just all slides off the brain, right? And like having this at your fingertips yeah, yeah, yeah. already integrated where it's like, all right, I'm gonna be in Discord for DTNS or for, you know, a, a, another project or something like that. It's like, oh, I wonder like just having that like so available in a place that you're always going to be checking like that seems like it's super, uh, would, would be super valuable for someone that, you know, has, has made a couple of steps, but wants to, you know, keep that knife a little sharp uh, when they when they don't have other resources to do that. Yeah, because it pushes you to think about words that you might not think about otherwise and, and call them up on the spot, which anytime I've actually been traveling and, and been in another country, I've chickened out a lot of times from trying, <laughs> trying to say stuff because I'm like, ah, I, don't, I can't remember suddenly. So this is a little like a safe space for that because you're typing, right? Mm -hmm. It's like a half step. You don't have to actually have performance anxiety when you're practicing. Well, it's, it's interesting, though, that Monica Chin from The Verge was trying it out. And she was saying, like, sometimes it can go from, like, real informal to very stiff manners, you know, in, in different mm -hmm. languages uh, where, where that's like 
I mean, all languages make that very apparent in, in some context or another. I wonder, though, if this takes off as like a popular way to learn languages, if we will see this feedback in where we where we like have this this kind of mishmash of of styles, like I, like whatever the the GPT effect of language learning. Right. Mm. Obviously, these models will get better. Well, but I wonder if, yeah. if, if there will like, be a feedback effect to that of you could of, like, of oh, I could tell you learned it on Membot. Yeah, yeah. 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 Where, where yeah, it goes yeah. from like Chaucer to like, you know, like you know, your Cockney. You know, <laughs> Well, yeah, <laughs> especially because more m most languages, English is unusual in that respect, have a formal version that you're supposed to speak at certain times and to certain people uh, and an and a informal version that, that you're supposed to speak in certain situations. And it may be that chatbots, chat, chatbots just don't know the difference. So they just kind of flail back and forth between. It's them. radically egalitarian, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and so like that, that's how you tell that's how you tell the membot uh, learner is because they just wildly flail between formal and informal. With no <laughs> this is one of those I would love to jump 20, 25 years in the future and just see, because by then we will have, who, who knows what AI large language model integration happens in schools and education in general. I, I'd be really curious, has everybody got a new version of Spanish they speak and does everyone notice it or do we not care anymore because it's so prominent? Like yeah, this, yeah. That's fascinating. I would love to. The other well, thing I, they, I don't have that time machine yet, but I'm working on it. No, please hurry up. On it. <laughs> yeah. The other thing they mentioned real quick is uh, that they they see this as cooking. When you when you learn to cook, you don't say like, well, I'm really studying the theory still and the structure of chemistry. and the No, you just start cooking and you make mistakes and then you learn, you burn a few things and you go from there. They're like, we want language learning to be more like that. Let you do actual practice, make mistakes and learn from those. Right. Uh, folks, if you would like to try out the Membot, uh, while it's free, because eventually they're going to charge for it, we've got it active in our Discord uh, for our Daily Tech News Show. You can join the conversation there by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Oh, non-player characters, NPCs, they're essential. You got to find out how many hogs you need to go kill in World of Warcraft by <laughs> talking to one. Uh, they dole out other important information. They lend a little depth to the world with their backstories and their lore, but they can be a little predictable. You may get an option or two to choose from when you're talking to them, but they're not exactly free form. You just click to advance their predetermined script. Large language models promise to free the NPCs from those restraints. Maybe that's not a good thing if you're one of those people who's like, just give me the quest. I don't want to talk to you. But at Computex, NVIDIA showed off the ability to talk in natural language to NPCs. The demo showed off the Avatar Cloud Engine, or ACE for games. ACE includes NVIDIA's NEMO LLM deployment tools, so all their large language model tools, Reva speech-to-text and text-to-speech, uh, and can run locally, if you want to deploy it that way, or in the cloud. They worked with a company called Convey to do the AI part of this, so you, you want to judge this partly on Convey and partly on NVIDIA, but let's listen to a bit of the demo, and then, Scott, you tell me what you think of this. All right. Hey, Jen. How are you? Unfortunately, not so good. How come? I am worried about the crime around here. It's gotten bad lately. My ramen shop got caught in the crossfire. Can I help? If you want to do something about this, I have heard rumors that the powerful crime lord Kuman Aoki is causing all sorts of chaos in the city. Please he kill 10 pigs this for Kuman Aoki. <laughs> I'll talk to uh, him. So uh, it goes on from there, from there but uh, it's a little stiff sounding. Yeah. But if you didn't catch that, the first voice was just a person. That mm -hmm. was not recorded. That was a person talking to it. The the more, I am, my ramen shop has crime. That was the AI responding to what the person said. Yeah, it's, uh, I'll tell you this, and I think I've said this on the show maybe multiple times. My, my, my great golden calf of AI has been from the beginning when hearing about all this new technology was, when are we going to see this in video games as part of NPC interaction, story interaction, this sort of stuff. That's really fascinating to me. And putting aside the, the long conversation we can have about writers and who, uh, who writes what and when they should write it and that sort of thing, um, this is a really impressive demo at a very base level. It's, it's saying, look, a player can interact directly with these non-player characters, and those conversations can be more dynamic and more meaningful. The way it works now in your typical uh, uh, RPG, we'll use something like Baldur's Gate as an example. Baldur's Gate will say a bunch of cool dialogue, 
and then you will have a, a bunch of choices to choose from to respond to them. And some of that has to do with your alignment as a, as a D and D character, other factors, but you can make your choice about what you want to say. You can be rude. You can be nice. And then they'll respond in different ways, depending on how you responded. That's great, except that's always been a finite process, right? There's only so many things the NPC is going to say to you and so many responses you're going to be able to say. And there's enough of them that it feels immense, but it really isn't that immense. And like, again, I say it's finite. In this case, the potential anyway, is for you to talk to this dude at the, at the sushi bar and even go off on tangents. Now, the, the, the game designers are going to probably want to hone that in and, and then keep a fence around things a little bit. And I think they can get creative with how they do that so it doesn't feel as fenced in. Um, I, I think the, there's really no limit to how far and how cool this could get. The only thing I would say about this early demo is there's not a lot of conjunctions being used or, uh, uh, you know, other other natural methods of speaking in these sentences. He did sentences. say it's at the beginning, but then he stopped. That then was kind stopped. of the last one yeah. I noticed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is, again, could be a character thing, and that's fine. Sure. You may design sure. a character like that. You'd want Data to talk that way and other characters like that, more robotic sort of characters. But if you really want dynamic stuff with, uh, you know, with accents and you know, a, a belligerent troll in a, in a, in a tavern or something, they're going to have to go a little bit further with that stuff. But, um, the only other thing I would say is I think I, at least I feel in my guts that most players, I could be wrong about this. So please write in about this, but I think most players do not want to talk to their games. This has been proved out through other texts and other means. Like when it came to the, the Xbox connect, uh, mm -hmm. there were a lot of games mm -hmm. that were like, well, just talk to the game and it'll answer. People hated that. They just want to take a controller and they want to scroll down to an option. I think that's still a big possibility here because it doesn't mean just because you're choosing from check text uh, solutions, it doesn't mean that those aren't also cool and dynamically generated. Based yeah, on that, what the yeah that's said. what I was going to say. You could you could still type to the game or mm -hmm. even have uh, you know dynamically generated stuff from from a, a chat bot. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wonder how much of that resistance do you think is because it hasn't been good that the experience mm. of talking to a game was never as good as it is now. It's never been very good. This could change that. That's true. I just think we have a kind of a natural inclination to not want... There, there's a very uncomfortable feeling of, well, what do I even say to this thing that isn't real? And I know it isn't real. Like there, we, That is maybe a generational thing where mm. a whole other generation of people will figure that out and it'll be fine. Yeah, so I think, I'm sorry I think about initially... the crime. I just want to show you ramen with extra chashu. <laughs> well, thanks. Right. Well, but and, what, and also... what, what it really does, though, is it means that they can not... I, I don't want to use the term control the narrative, but that is kind of what it is. If they limit what you can say back... That could be a creative way for them to say, look how dynamic and strange this conversation is, but also we need you on this track of the story that we're trying to tell in this game. And there's going to be a lot of that discussion in devs uh, in, in meeting rooms this week or you know beyond when it comes to this demo. Because at the end of the day, it can't just be everything's whatever. I mean, it can be, but you know, compelling gameplay and what we understand about game theory needs some structure. And how will they maintain that structure without it flying off the handle because I asked the guy how his cat's doing and before you know it, it's six hours of cat conversations. <laughs> well, and on the other end of that, uh, you know, the, the writing and then kind of constructing the game mechanic of that is one thing, but also what this demo clearly shows is that voice acting is a huge part of like selling the reality of that game. And that's honestly like the visuals of that demo, you know, it's it's in Unreal Engine 5, looks fantastic. Oh, yeah. And then the voices, you know, it's kind of, flat and a, a little robotic but what what i actually think is exciting is the idea that you know voice actors can come in they can they can do a core set of of samples you could then you know be able to auto generate uh, uh, uh speech based on that and one that would allow you theoretically to maybe move out dlc where you don't have to you know bring in the actors and, and have that recording and stuff like that it would maybe speed development time there but also provide like passive income for those uh -huh. actors, depending on how that's structured, of being like, yeah, I'm yeah, like yeah. The, the Fallout 8 uh, voice guy for this, you know, mayor of this town. And, you know, I get a little check every once in a while. Like, I, I actually think that could be a boon it could for, be for voice like actors. Yeah. 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 I mean, it all, all, obviously, it all depends on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it depends on a lot of things. But um, I've been talking to my, uh, this is not a name drop, but Liam O'Brien and I have been friends for years. And um, he and I talk about these issues all the time. Like, what, what do voice actors do in the face of this sort of thing? And I think that that's the right answer. 
Um, the idea of taking, let's say, Liam, and we when we need him for a dynamic exchange that happens in World of Warcraft as he plays various characters in there. And so we'll take one of his characters and we'll say, all right, do all this dialogue and 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 we'll train the, the AI to do it. The, the answer is, that sounds awesome. That sounds great. It's also less work for him, by the way. But if there's passive income in there and these contracts are set up in such a way to take care of these voice actors, this might be a really great path toward that equity that we're all a little bit worried about. Yeah. Um, I don't know how we do that for visual artists. That's still a big question in my mind. That's still the most murky end of this spectrum for for AI for me. But but I think that's a really great idea. And you'd have the best of both worlds. You'd have dynamic Liam O'Brien voicing a ton of content. And at the same time, uh, real Liam O'Brien is actually being compensated for his work. And that's that's a gap right now. You know, That's where the fight should stuff. be. I feel like a lot of people, and probably because they're not actually involved in the fight, are like, I don't know, this sounds like a bad idea. It might ruin X, right? Uh, whereas this is actually time savers. And we shouldn't look at every time saver and every efficiency includer and every quality raiser as not worth it because it could change things. What we need to do is look for solutions like Rich just uh, mentioned and say like, hey, let's let's fight for that. Let's let's not fight against the technology. Let's fight for using the technology in, in, in a good and way that that is good for everybody. Yep. All right. Well, Scott and Tom, have you ever played Tetris and mm-hmm. thought, I wish this was a nerve wracking in a less geometrically satisfying way. Anybody? No, Anybody? Not okay. So much. Uh, well, then, even if you have it, you might still want to check out Cetris. This is a new game on uh, itch.io from developer MS Levo. The game initially looks like regular old Tetris. When you start it up, you see the familiar falling block shapes coming down from the top. But when they hit the bottom, instead of tidy rows that are satisfying to clear, they turn into pixelated sand. You clear rows by connecting contiguous lines of sand of the same color across the screen. So they don't have to be in straight lines. They just have to go across the screen. Uh, It's available on a pay-what-you-want model on Windows and Linux. Shout out to Linux. I'm playing this. uh, I I just want to say I think it's rad. (laughs) And it's really not. What's great about it is the shapes don't matter anymore, only Mm. in one way. They matter Mm. in volume of sand predictability. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So so when you've got a T or an L piece coming down, you no longer care about rotating it left, right, or if it's the right or left version of that piece. You just want to make sure that when you lay it down, that big L bump at the bottom kind of has a little extra sand and the physic pull it this way where you're missing some brown sand and the blue sand's in the way. Like it sounds a little weird. I think it's brilliant and amazing, and I love it. It's certainly pretty. I'll give you that. The physics <laughs> yeah. are amazing. It looks. I haven't tried it, so maybe I'll change my tune if I try it. But yeah, it looks it looks like a pain. Yeah, it's good though. It's real good. And right. and and keep in mind, like, I think your brain would work well for this. I think you're pretty good at predictive visual stuff. Like you see a thing and go, I think that's probably would hold two gallons or whatever. That's the trick with this game is just going. Well, that piece isn't enough sand for the volume I need mm-hmm. to fill this mm-hmm. gap. And so you'll use it somewhere else, yeah. which is a weird thing to do with a game that looks like Tetris. Like it is a <laughs> totally different game. Yeah, I don't know how they came up with this idea. It's, it's, yeah. it's super brilliant. Wild. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Yeah, so yesterday Adam wrote in. He was asking about setting up commercial EV chargers. Like he was like, I have this spot I think would be really good. How do I do this? I have no idea. Well, Bodhi wrote in responding to the email. He says, if Adam wanted to partner with an existing EV charging network, then contacting ChargePoint, uh, EVgo, or Blink would be a good option, you know, utilizing their network. But he says, if he wants to own and operate the chargers themselves, then Shoals has an e-mobility division that would be a good place to start. He says they don't make L3 chargers, but they do consider consult with how to do it, and they have partners with manufacturers as well. He also says some states offer incentives for installing new charging station, and there might be some federal money as well to look into. And Bodhi actually did an interview at CES with uh, Shoals and Autel Energy, which is an L3 uh, charger manufacturer, uh, and we'll have links to that in the show notes as well. Ah, Bodie from the Kilowatt Podcast. If you don't yeah. know him, been a, been a guest on the show many times. We should we should get him back uh, one of these days soon. But uh, thank you for writing in, Bodie. And we forwarded this uh, to Adam as well. So between Chris and Bodie and the rest of y'all in the audience, Adam, Adam's going to get some help. So yeah. so I'm sure he appreciates it, and we appreciate it too. Nice. 
All right, well, a big thank you to Scott You had Jump to think about whether you wanted to thank Scott. <laughs> I yeah, did. I, I was like, yeah. you know what? The, the generative AI stuff. Uh, okay. <laughs> you know what? It was good, Scott. Okay, fine. All thank right, you. fine. Okay. I appreciate the thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Where can people uh, check out more of your great stuff online, Scott, for more great Scottisms? Well, uh, this stuff with NVIDIA's tech and a bunch of other stuff are going to come up for sure on a show I do called Core. We do it on usually Thursdays, but this week, Diablo... Four's uh, early access starts tomorrow. So we are pushing the show to Friday because we want to have lots and lots of Diablo content. If that sounds interesting to you, plus all the other stuff going on in the game space, then do check out the show. I think you'd really enjoy it. I'm not just saying that. I think we have something special with Core. So go check it out. That's at frogpants.com slash core or just search for Core on all the podcast apps. They all have it. We'd love to have you there. Excellent. Uh, real quick, before we get out of here, I want to thank uh, Greenville Smart Center, uh, greenvillesmart.com. If you're traveling through Southern Illinois, uh, it's in conjunction with Greenville University, a little innovator, entrepreneur uh, space, and, and they were kind enough to lend me their podcast studio here. So uh, go check it out. It's it's uh, it's my hometown, so I'm a little proud that there's something cool like this going on here. But go, go to greenvillesmart.com uh, and check that out as well. Now, patrons. Don't go anywhere. You're getting the extended show, Good Day Internet. We're going to talk about XDA developers Tim Contasano's argument that Sony should bring back the Xperia Play phone. Bring it back. It's time. Yes, the time is now and the time that you can catch us live every single Monday through Friday with DTNS is 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. And if that wasn't clear, you can find out more at DailyTechNewsShow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with the man, the plan, the canal, Justin Robert Young. See you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at FrogPants.com. Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>